If you were thrown into a wave five stories high, how could you avoid being swallowed by the ocean? A professional surfer can do it with just a board. When the Pacific morning light shined over Waikiki, ancient Hawaiians were holding a sacrificial ceremony. They selected the thickest trees and offered them to the sea god with the highest ritual. They thanked the sea god for his protection and prayed for peace. The logs were then hollowed and polished to make surfboards up to seven meters long. The chief rode on the boards through giant waves. How did the chief manage to harness this overwhelming force? Let's turn our attention back in time to the ancient Greek city of Syracuse in the third century BC, following the blue waves. The king suspected his goldsmith of adulterating the crown, so he summoned Archimedes, the city's most brilliant scholar. Archimedes pondered deeply until he stepped into the public bathhouse. When he saw the water overflowing the tub, an idea struck him. He rushed naked out of the bathhouse and ran towards the palace, shouting, Eureka! Thus, Archimedes' principle of buoyancy was born. This principle is so intuitive that we take it for granted. An object immersed in fluid experiences an upward, buoyant force. Its magnitude equals the weight of fluid displaced. Now back to Hawaii. The ancient Hawaiians knew no formulas, but they were masters of buoyancy. A board seven meters long and half a meter wide could displace hundreds of liters of seawater. One liter of seawater weighs about one kilogram. This means that the board could provide hundreds of kilograms of buoyancy. An adult chief plus the board weighs maybe less than 200 kilograms. It was this immense lifting force from displacing water that lets the chief stand steadily on the sea. Even smarter, they sanded the board with shark skin and then rubbed on coconut oil to make it waterproof, preventing it from soaking and getting heavy. This was the earliest board wax. But Archimedes' theory is a static theory. He explained buoyancy, but not control. Floating is not surfing. Surfing is motion. When you start paddling, chasing a wave, you immediately feel an enemy, the water desperately pulling you. This enemy is resistance. How to overcome resistance? Let's back to 16th century Florence. Leonardo da Vinci's gaze was shifting from the Mona Lisa to what he was truly obsessed with, water. In experiments, he discovered the secret of shape. Blunt objects, like a block, create chaotic swirls. He called it dead water, but sharp shapes, mimicking fish and birds, let water flow smoothly over the surface. Da Vinci thus created the streamlined form. Again, ancient Hawaiians intuited the answer. They shaped surfboards rounded in front, tapered behind to coax the water, allowing the water to cling and slide past the board shedding that stagnant, slow-moving waters. However, the smooth glide is only half the story. The force that lifts surfers from the water and gives them true takeoff lies hidden in England nearly a century later. Isaac Newton, with his famous third law, that for every action there is an equal and opposite reaction, unraveled the mystery of surfing takeoff. You stand on the surfboard, wait on your back foot, nose slightly lifted. At this point, your surfboard forms an angle with the water. The sole of your surfboard acts like a high-speed shovel or a slap, forcefully pushing the oncoming water downwards. This is the action. Water has been slapped hard across the face. By Newton's third law, it must retaliate immediately. Water will push your surfboard upwards with an equal and opposite force. This is the reaction and the force pushing it upwards is the kinetic lift. This works on the same principle as when you skip stones on water. The kinetic lift is so strong that it can lift your surfboard and your body out of the water and into a gliding state. But when you try to change direction, Newton's theory encounters a new dilemma. Why doesn't the tilting board slide off course, but instead grips the water firmly? The answer to this mystery was already written in the sounds of flowing water in 18th century Switzerland. Mathematician Daniel Bernoulli was pondering a question. How does water flow in a pipe? He formulated the famous Bernoulli's principle. In the same fluid, whether water or air, the faster the flow, the lower the pressure, the slower the flow, the higher the pressure. This principle is counterintuitive. Let's try a little experiment. Take two parallel sheets of paper, blow air between them. 
you'll find that they don't separate, but actually stick together. Why? Because the air is faster and the pressure is lower where you blow air, while the outside air is slower and the pressure is higher, pushing the two pieces of paper together. Now you're surfing. You want to turn left. You shift your weight onto the left rail. Your surfboard's tail fin cuts into the water, forcing the current to split. The water flows over the outside of your turn, taking a longer, wider turn, so the current must be faster. The water flows over inside, taking a shorter, narrower turn, and the current is relatively slower. The outside has a faster flow and lower pressure, resulting in suction. The inside has a slower flow and higher pressure, resulting in thrust. This huge pressure difference is the grip you feel when turning. It's like an invisible hand pulling you against the wave wall, letting you carve a perfect arc. It was Duke Kahanamoku, an Olympic swimming champion of Hawaiian royal lineage, who popularized surfing as a symbol of Hawaii to the world in 1915, taking his wooden surfboard to the beaches of Sydney, Australia. Before thousands, he paddled gracefully, stood up, and effortlessly navigated the crests of the waves. This stunning performance brought surfing into the modern world's view. Duke's performance was a silent demonstration of fluid dynamics. He floated using Archimedes' buoyancy, propelled himself forward using Leonardo da Vinci's streamlined body, and then glided into the air using Newton's dynamic lift. Most astonishingly, he even used his feet to enter the water, acting as temporary biological tail fins and used Bernoulli's principle to steer and brake. However, this foot rudder steering method was ultimately inefficient. Duke's performance inspired deeper technological innovation. By the 1930s, a real wooden tail fin was fixed to the bottom of the surfboard. This small fin became a dedicated actuator for Bernoulli's principle, greatly enhancing grip during turns and completely liberating surfers from the constraints of straight line gliding. From the Hawaiian chief's unconscious mastery of Archimedes to Leonardo da Vinci's epiphany on streamlined design, from Newton's flight to Bernoulli's ingenious turning, ultimately, a small tail fin brought all the theories together. Humans, with our small bodies, keep exploring the grand laws of nature. As Horace said, we are confined to our small rooms, yet on the boundless sea, we search everywhere for the direction our hearts have wandered in. This surfboard carries not only our bodies, but also our insatiable yearning for freedom. A yearning that has existed for millennia. A yearning to find freedom within constraints. Life is not confined to tracks, but to the boundless sea. Our journey opens up in all directions.